Good morning. I feel I'm standing here like a teacher just waiting for everybody to be quiet, you know. My presence alone. Uh -huh. Happy New Year to you all. I read somewhere that a, a little sort of uh, greeting for the New Year that said, and may all your troubles be as short-lived as your New Year resolutions were. So, I didn't make it up myself, can I, can I claim the, the, the brain to make it up? Um, so we, we start a new sermon series today, Stealth. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the front cover of your order of service, but it's very sort of futuristic. And I kept saying last week to folk, I'm sure this has got something to do with James Bond or something, you know, like stealth, it just sounded like that. So of course I had to Google it. And apparently Stealth was a film that was released in 2005, but set in the near future. Um, and it features artificial intelligence uh, being used to control a fighter bomber plane um, that develops its own sort of sentience, they kept saying. So that's, that's quite posh. However, Alistair will deliver the sermon later on. Um, and I'm sure it's got nothing to do with fighter bombers, so we're okay. Um, your order of service today is, uh, doesn't actually say this, but Janet is on children's story, Elaine is on the prayer for others, and Fiona is reading for us. Um, so with all that in mind, shall we take a wee minute to just still our hearts for worship? Will you join me please in saying the words on bold that will miraculously appear, that have miraculously appeared on the screens. A new day has dawned. A new year begun. Father, call us so we may hear your voice. The world turns to hopes and dreams of the future. Father, keep us in your ways and on your path. We enter this new year with hope and excitement. Father, remind us that you lead us, guide us as we look to you and worship you. Amen. And we will begin that worship today by singing hymn 623, which will miraculously appear on the screens or in the pew Bibles in front of you, hymn 623.
Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Father, in love you created us and came to us as a babe born in a barn. In love, you welcome us as your children. In love, you lead us faithfully. And with mercy, you hear our prayers. We praise and thank you, Lord. Hear us, your beloved children, as we come before you in worship. Jesus, our Redeemer, you have come to save the world and to save us. You call us to follow you. You teach us truth. In our troubles, you offer us peace. Meet us as we come to hear your word. Holy Spirit, living one, in the beginning you breathed life into chaos and darkness. You brought hope. And on one starry night, you brought good news that a saviour was born. On one early morning, you defeated death forever. Speak to us, your people, wherever we are, whoever we are. God, loving Father, Son and Spirit, we come. Yet we know we come with doubts and fears. We know we come in ignorance. We know we have failed you, your creation and your people in many ways. We cannot grasp your love for us, O God, for it is unlike us to be that loving and that forgiving. We become enmeshed by our own needs and wants and desires, and we fail to see anything beyond our own little circles. Turn us around, Father. Help us to see as you see, and to reach out as you reach out. Trusting in your love, we turn again to you. As we open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness, grant us your peace. Lord Jesus, please forgive us. Heal us deep within, so that we love and trust you more deeply day by day. Accept these prayers. Accept our worship. Accept us. Forgive who we are and bless who we will be. These things we pray through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to us, who is with us, and who will come again. Amen. I have um, quite a few no notices uh, this morning, so I'll just wire on with them. Um, for those of you who were reading the screens, there is not a pastoral care team meeting this week. It's the pastoral care development team that is meeting this week. So that's just uh, Sandra, Fiona, Janet, Alistair and myself. So pastoral care team, you can stand down uh, for this week. Um, there is a session meeting on Tuesday the 16th. So not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday the 16th of January at 7 for 7.15, teas and coffees and so on first as always. Um, the Guild meets this Friday at 6.30pm here in the Kirk. We are doing our sort of not a burn supper type, burn supper type thing. Um, so we ask this time for a, a suggested donation of around £5 just to cover the costs of the haggis, the neeps, the tatties and all the rest of it. Uh, there is a side up sheet at the back in the window at that side so if you would like to come to that but if you have any dietary requirements then please just note them in there but whether you, if you would like to come at all just put your name down so that we know roughly how many we're catering for uh, and that's fine uh, there's a welcome and hospitality team meeting on the 10th which must be Wednesday it's at 7 o'clock in the 4 room and next Sunday after worship there's a questers meeting so that's sort of children and young people and those who volunteer to help out at questers that's next sunday the 14th after morning worship so i think those are all the meetings um 
also on the theme of sort of welcome and hospitality. The welcome and hospitality team wants to arrange a deep clean of here and the Kirk Centre. So we will be looking for volunteers for that in a wee pile and that I know is on their agenda for this week. So we will be looking for volunteers to help with that but we're still looking for anybody who can volunteer to help out with the cleaning of the Kirk and the Kirk Centre whilst we await the appointment of a new caretaker. Um, so if anybody can help with that, come and see me or Sandra or is Doug here today? No, can I see him? But anybody that you think, oh, he is, hello. Um, <laughs> or Doug Winchester, if you can see any of us um, here, then that would be fine if you think you can uh, help with any of that. And that would be good. And the other thing that I have to intimate is the beginning of the um, prayer group, which will be meeting on alternate Wednesdays starting on the 17th of January. We're starting it with a sort of course called Be Still, which um, teaches you to be just sort of calm with God and not to be thinking too much about, you know, the frenzy that's going on. It just sort of calms you down and it teaches you to sort of take time with God. And if, if once we can learn to do that sort of thing, then prayer, I think, comes more naturally if you can learn to do that. So it starts with the Be Still on Wednesday the 17th and that's at 6.45 uh, across in the Kirk Centre. Right, I'm done. You'll be pleased to know. Um, does anybody have offering for me? Oh, teamwork makes the dream work. Thank you, you two. Very kind. Right, so shall we say a wee prayer to bless the offering? All good gifts come from you, Father. And from those gifts, we bring our offering. Help us to use it to do what you would want us to do in this place and to help people in need. Help us to be generous givers, Father. Generous with our money, our time, our talents, and our lives, so that we make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. And now I'm going to ask Janet to come and read the children's story. Hello, everyone. Up you come. It's lovely to see everyone again. It's lovely. I guess you're late. <laughs> How's everyone? Have you had a good break? Yeah. And it all, it's all starting again tomorrow, isn't it? You lucky people. School. It's school, I know. And Logan had his birthday. Fancy Logan being two, everyone. Fancy him being two now. Did he enjoy his party? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Right. Hopefully everyone has had... Oh, he said yes. Good. Um, hopefully everyone's had a lovely time and enjoyed your presence and especially enjoy being with people. I think that's the important thing. Good. Right. Okay. Now, if you remember back... It's not all that long ago that we were here for Sophie's christening, for her baptism. So the story today is when Jesus is baptized. And that happened when he was all grown up. It didn't happen when he was a baby. So here we go. John was shouting. John was shouting in the wilderness. God is sending someone special, he shouted, and you better get ready to meet him. Many people listened to John. They thought that he was someone special. He lived in the wilderness, after all, by the River Jordan. He wore a scratchy camel hair shirt, and he ate locusts for lunch. He lived very, very simply. But I'm not the special one, John shouted. Why, I'm not even special enough to stoop down and undo his sandals. No, I'm just here to help you get ready to meet him. And how do we do that, someone shouted back. You repent, John shouted. That's a tricky word. That's how you stop doing what's bad and you start doing what's good. 
If you meet a poor man, you don't tell him to go away. You give him food and clothes. If you're a tax collector, you don't take more than you're supposed to. You're honest and kind. And if you're a soldier, you don't bully people. You protect them and take care of them. And what about us? Shouted some very religious people. You, John shouted louder than ever, you need to stop pretending that you're perfect and admit that you've done things that made God sad. I'll say it again. God is sending someone special. And you, all of you, need to get ready to meet him. So come, let me dip you in this river to show God that you want your lives to change. And that's what he did. The people came, John dipped them in the river. And then one day when all the shouting and dipping was done, someone else came too. Who do you think it was? It was Jesus. 30 years old now and all grown up. John recognized him right away and stopped his shouting. You're the special one, aren't you? He whispered, and Jesus just smiled. That's right, Jesus said, and I want you to dip me too. Oh no, John said, it should be the other way around. Listen, said Jesus, it's time I began the work I was sent here to do. And that is how my father wants me to get started. So John agreed and he and Jesus waded out into the river. Can you imagine that? John dipped Jesus into the river, that's right. And when he came back up again, shaking the wet from his eyes, the clouds parted and a dove landed on Jesus' shoulder. It was a sign that God was with Jesus. Well done, son, God said. I'm proud of you. You really are someone special. Okay, so there's the story of how Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. Okay, are we ready to say a prayer together? Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for the time spent celebrating Jesus' birth, enjoying our presence and spending time with those we love. Be with pupils and teachers as schools start again tomorrow. And help us always to do our best to be honest and kind to others as you would like us to be. Amen. And now we're going to share the Lord's Prayer and it will come up on the screen for folks as well. So let us pray again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Right, we're going to sing Big Family of God, which is what we all are here. So, good luck tomorrow. Have a lovely day. Same to the teachers. I will be thinking about you. Some of us are big and tall, some of us are very small.
children are welcome and the young people to go through next door now. Even if you're just visiting, you're very welcome to join in. You've got to hope that they take all that energy back to school with them tomorrow, haven't you? And there's none of them in my class, so it's fine. Um, we'll continue our worship by singing hymn 533, Will You Come and Follow Me, hymn 533. Shape the world around 
reading this morning is from Mark chapter 1, reading verses 4 to 11, which can be found on page 1002. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word. founder of the Church of Scotland, John Knox, once said, no one else holds or has held the place in the heart of the world which Jesus holds. Other gods have been as devoutly worshipped. No other man has been so devoutly loved. Bono, the lead singer of the band U2, once said, taking a lead, I think, from the writer C.S. Lewis, I think the defining question for Christian is, who was Christ? He went on to say, And I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God or he was nuts. And I find it hard to accept that millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched, have felt lives touched and inspired by some nutter. About this time last year, we ran a course called Alpha, which takes participants to a series of videos and discussions that explore the Christian faith. In one of those videos, they ask the question, who is Jesus? Here's some of the answers from one of those videos. Who is Jesus? Mm. Uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, I believe he was a person. Um, he's the son of God. I don't believe Jesus ever really existed. The son of God. If I have to answer that question, I would say God. Uh, he plays on the wing for Chelsea. If you read the Bible, I, I don't think I believe in all of that. Everything. <laughs> he can be any, but for me he's everything. Who is Jesus? To be honest with you, I don't know. I'm not super religious or anything, so. I mean, he, I guess he's a savior or something. <laughs> Personally, I think that Jesus was probably a really cool dude who lived a long time ago and gave great advice to people, and it snowballed from there. One of the most basic, fundamental questions about the Christian faith is, who is Jesus? Every person who's walked through the doors of our church will, even in a tiny way, have asked themselves the question, who is Jesus? Our artwork and logos and 
windows show images of him or associated with him. Our prayers mention him. Our hymns and songs sing of him. And me or whoever is talking that morning speaks of him in some way. Yet, in some ways, Jesus appears to be a little mysterious, a little stealthy, a little hard to grasp at times. This season of the church year is called Epiphany, and the meaning of Epiphany is to reveal more and more about who Jesus is. The end of the season of Epiphany comes with a pretty weird story about Jesus called the Transfiguration, where Jesus is more or less fully revealed to those closest to him. But that's getting ahead of ourselves because Epiphany starts off with an altogether stealthy moment. A moment when something is revealed about who Jesus is but not fully explained. And there's something about this kind of mystery that drives and compels us as human beings to find out more. And why wouldn't you? Whether you have faith or not, Jesus Christ has been one of the most influential people to ever have lived. And our basic humanness compels us to find out more and more about the person who has influenced the world in such a way. And that's what the season of Epiphany is all about. And so here's Jesus appearing on the scene. And Mark writes, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. In autumn last year, we spent a little bit of time as a church community exploring some words that we use in church all the time that we possibly don't always capture the full meaning of. The series was called Kirkies, as in the language of the church. And here, even before we fully entered into the full story of Jesus, we have a Kirk E's word. Mark writes, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The word baptize is a Kirk E's type of word. At its simplest level, it's a symbolic action that a person goes through when they become a Christian. The action involves some water with the person being baptized, either marred with water or submerged under the water. But no matter how the action takes place, the symbolism is the same. It's about dying to our old life and the water symbolically washing away the old life and all the symbolic and sometimes actual grime and dirt and yuckiness of that life and being sort of symbolically reborn into a new life as we come up out of the water. Now at this point, if we were completely new readers of the stories of Jesus, we might not know that for Jesus to be baptised is a little strange. It's a little strange because one of the fundamental beliefs about Jesus is that he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't commit any sins, and so he didn't actually need that washing away of the old life and being reborn into a new life because he's the only human being in history not to need that washing away thing. And so why Jesus felt the need to be baptized by John is a question that's interested thinkers for quite a while. And basically the answer they've come up with is that Jesus isn't baptized because he needed to be baptized. He was baptized for two other reasons. Firstly, it was a way of Jesus fully identifying with humanity. Jesus was saying by being baptized that he was fully a human being and living his life as a human being. He wasn't just pretending to be human. He wasn't just play acting, being human. He was an actual human. And so his baptism identifies him as a human fully and completely. And the second reason that Jesus is baptized 
is that it marks the beginning of his ministry. It marks the beginning of the journey of faith he takes. And again, by doing that, Jesus identifies with us. For people of faith, most of us will have experienced baptism at some point in our lives. Some folks in our church will have done this as an adult, others as a younger person, and a whole lot of folks like me as a baby. Now, it's a bit of a quirk of tradition that the Church of Scotland, along with a number of other churches, baptise babies. Now, this isn't something that we've got time to explore this morning, although why the Church of Scotland does this is quite fascinating and worth exploring to give us an understanding of our traditions and why we practice them. But the point remains that no matter when you've been baptised, in some way it marks the beginning of our journey of faith. And in many ways, the actual moment of baptism, significant as it may be for some people, is not the important thing. The most important thing is the journey that we take afterwards. For Jesus, his journey took him through some great highs and some lows, many of which we'll explore over this series and the next couple of series. Jesus' journey following his baptism led him to mountaintops and wilderness valleys. It led him to, into debates with religious leaders, miraculous healings, actual storms, betrayal, injustice, a trial on trumped up charges, beating, executions, and then an incredible world-changing miracle. And often our journey of faith mirrors this. Rarely, and I would be even so bold enough to say that never has anyone walked the journey of faith without experiencing hardship and pain, as well as triumphs and joys. But the thing that also marks out Jesus' journey of faith, and the thing that is so important as we live out our journey of faith, is that he did it in community. Jesus didn't walk the path of faith and of ministry alone. He made a group of close friends and they walked the road together. Jesus had 12 disciples who journeyed with him and walked through many of the highs and lows with him. I mean, sometimes the disciples were the cause of his troubles and lows, but in the end, Jesus tasked these followers with carrying on his work once he'd gone. This is how much he trusted and continued to trust them. And this is something that's key that's completely fundamental to our journey of faith. We don't go the journey alone. We always go with community. The other week on a Friday morning when the kids were at school and Nicola was out at Cardboard Cafe, I decided to use those rare moments of alone and quiet time to watch the film The Way. It's a film that's been on my list of films that I wanted to watch for quite a while. It's written and directed by Emilio Estevez and stars his real life father, Martin Sheen, possibly best known these days for playing US President uh, Josiah Bartlett in the acclaimed series The West Wing. Sheen portrays Tom, an eye doctor with a chip on his shoulder. When Tom gets the news that his estranged adult son has died in a tragic accident, Tom travels to France to take care of the body. Tom's son Daniel, played by Estevez in flashbacks, was an adventurer and wanderer who was about to embark on a pilgrimage called the El Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James. Its route crosses from France into Spanish Basque country, eventually ending in the Galicia at the Cathedral of Santiago del Compostela, where the remains of St. James are traditionally thought to be buried. In a grief-filled decision, Tom cremates the body, picks up Daniel's loaded backpack, and heads off on the pilgrimage spreading the ashes of his son along the way. By nature, Tom is quiet and introverted and wants to walk the journey alone, but along the way he encounters some fellow travellers 
and is reluctantly encouraged to share the journey with them. There's just an overweight and extrovert Dutchman. Sarah is an embittered Canadian harboring some deep wounds. And then there's Jim from Ireland, who is a writer trying to overcome writer's block along the Camino. Together, they begin to form friendships and begin to share their stories. And importantly, they begin to realize that despite their differences, they wouldn't be able to complete the journey alone. In an interview with Christianity Today magazine just after the release of the film, Martin Sheen explained, every time Tom did it on his own, he got into trouble. It was only when he went into the community that he realized he could rely on people, that everything is broken, but, but how we make up for brokenness is through each other. How it all pans out is, well, I'm not gonna give you any spoilers. You'll have to go and watch the film for yourselves. But the point is, it's the journey and the journey with others that changed and began to heal Tom. Bob Goff is an American lawyer, speaker, and author. He tells a story about a summer adventure hitchhiking across New England. In, in, in the story, he says, when I was in college, I took a few months and hitchhiked around New England. I met some really interesting people along the way, and a few creepy ones too. In truth, I suppose I was looking a little creepy myself as a barefoot 19-year-old with flaming red hair down to my shoulders, torn jeans, and a stained t-shirt. I didn't need much, just a ride and a pair of shoes. When people pulled over to give me a ride, I tried to size them up before I got in the car, and they were no doubt trying to figure out whether I was safe before they picked me up. I suppose the same thing happens in our faith communities every day. We want to know who we can trust and who we ought to pass by, who we ought to go with and who we should avoid. In short, we're all trying to figure out how to live out our faith and who to do it with. This is what Tom learned on his journey in the way. He started out sizing up everyone and deciding that he'd rather be alone. But trying to do it all alone didn't really work for him. Jesus didn't size up his companions. He asked them to follow him and they came. He chose from the outset to journey in community. And even when that cost him abandonment and betrayal, he still lived in community. The legacy of this community that Jesus passed on is a community of followers of Jesus' way that's now known as the church. It's not a building. It's not a tradition. It's not even really a denomination. It's a community and a people. And at its heart, it's a community that we travel this journey of faith together with. You see, it's no surprise that those who manage to hold on to their faith most strongly are those who intentionally engage with and build the community known as the church and build it together with God. Rather than being an organization that controls or organizes our religious life, the church is at its best a community of fellow travelers who are wounded and broken and inconsistent and hypocritical and crabbed and joy-filled and who too need the strength of others to walk this journey. And to walk a journey that started for both Jesus and for us with some water and some words of love.
Thank you, Alistair. I've seen that film, by the way, and it's it's understated, but it's really, really good. And if you get the chance to see it, I would heartily recommend it. You can probably find it on Netflix or something like that these days. But the way, it's a really, really good film. Um, we'll continue our worship now by singing Holy Overshadowing. Spread your wings of mercy over me And guard my heart with true humility No shadow of the darkness pressing in Only the holy overshadowing Underneath your wings overshadowing Will I seek but God alone? No hiding place save only at your throne. Only the cross, the blood to wash my sin. Only the holy overshadowing underneath your wings, overshadowing. Join our hearts and minds in prayer for others, the world, and ourselves. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for the message of Christmas, that he who was with you in the beginning loved us enough to come down to earth and live among us. You are the creator of all things, snow and hail and frost, the persistent rain of the, last, the past week, the ice of winter, as well as the warmth of summer, and we marvel at the mysteries of your providence and shaping of our world. You have your own ways of working things out, 
of bringing peace within our borders, of bringing down oppressors, of lifting the humble and the meek. We bless you for justice, which is better than ours. We bless you for your good purpose, which is wiser than ours. We bless you for the future, which is your gift to us in this year of 2024. Help us to live in hope, not in fear, in love, not cynicism, in resolution, not despair, for Jesus Christ, our Saviour's sake. Gracious God, at the start of a new year, we bring you our hopes for the world and its peoples. Grant us peace in place of strife and desire for justice instead of a dash for growth, the building up of forests, not their pulling down, the cleansing, not the pollution of our seas, and in place of hatred, goodwill. We continue to pray for those caught up in the ongoing conflicts in the Ukraine and Gaza. We pray, the innocent, pray for the innocent victims who pay the price for others' quest for power. We ask for your healing to all those injured on all sides and peace and comfort for the families of those who have been killed. We pray for the King and for all the parliaments and councils of these islands in which we live. Grant them courage and wisdom for this year ahead, integrity of life, strength in every good resolution. And for all who lead in church and state, grant humble hearts and minds to listen to you and others, to distinguish the good from the bad, the wise from the foolish, the fruitful from the empty. God of guidance, we pray today for all who need your guidance and who need to hear your voice this year. We ask that you might enable others to see your goodness in our kindness and love and be the conduits of your light in our communities and churches. Lord, this year will bring its share of illnesses and bereavement and family conflict. We pray now for those who already face these trials. May they know your healing and hope, the good news of Jesus Christ, who is Lord of this life and the life to come, our brother who is human like us, yet picked up our frail bodies and took us with him into life eternal. May his spirit bear witness to these things, to what you are doing in, the lives, in their lives and ours. God of love, we bring today our praise for all those who are exhausted and need rest. For those suffering from long COVID, ME or any post-viral fatigue, for those who are working on the front line, the men and women of the emergency services who respond to needs of others day in, day out, 24-7, who need time to rest and recover. Lord, this year many words will be spoken in public in our land. We take a minute to reflect quietly on what lies ahead for each of us, to ask your help and blessing. Lord God, one day we will see all things gathered up in Jesus Christ. May we live now and always in the light and love of that. We ask all these prayers, said and unsaid, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Elaine, and thanks to Fiona and Janet as well for their parts in the service, and to the sound team, who don't always get a mention, but thank you, you two up there. Um, there are teas and coffees at the end of the service for those of you who would like to stay back for a cuppa and a chat, because chat is obligatory after all. Um, there's no save a loaf today, but it'll be back next week. And I should have said, actually, um, when I was doing the intimations at the cardboard, not the cardboard cafe, the larder, Community Shop and Community Cafe reopen on Thursday of this week and then they're back to their Thursday, Saturday routine as normal. So if you fancy a, a fine piece and soup on Thursday and or a bacon sandwich or whatever on a Saturday, then that's the place to be. Um, 
And remember as well, please, to sign up if you're coming to the Guild uh, on Friday. Uh, we'll finish our worship by singing hymn number 204, Christ is made the sure foundation. Let us look for Christ wherever we go. Let us never stop seeking, believing that there is a light that shines in the darkness, which the darkness shall not overcome. And may the love of the Creator, the joy of the Spirit, and the peace of the Christ child be with you this new year and evermore. Mm -hmm.